Hey everyone, Cassius and Sharky here, and welcome to the 1996 Baz Luhrmann episode. We are up to our final Romeo and Juliet, or sorry, Romeo plus Juliet, and I couldn't be more excited. After last week, I am stating with a pretty high level of confidence that it can only go uphill this time. You would need to actively try to be worse than the previous one, yeah. Let's jump right into the 1996 Baz Luhrmann Romeo plus Juliet, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes. We start with the chorus, kicked off in a way that immediately evokes Michael Almereta's Hamlet. With its clearly modern take, switching classical Italian feuding families to modern feuding business families whose buildings are right across from each other. We then cut to the trailer, I mean the introduction of the movie that looks suspiciously like a trailer, where we find out that Lord Capulet's first name in this is Fulgencio, but Montague's first name is Ted. Anyone up for Fulgencio and Ted's excellent adventure? Is that just me? The families apparently brawl on the streets in this city where you're not allowed to hold a shot for more than three seconds at a time. I assume that's why Lerman cuts between takes like he's making a music video on speed. We actually do get a rock-solid Almereta connection as Dan Venora, who was Gertrude in that movie, is playing Lady Capulet here. But onto the opening scene. I wonder how such a modern take will allow for an opening fight without many casualties. We get through this event via hysterical screaming, questionable shirt patterns, and constant referrals to firearms as swords. The entire fight devolves into a full-fledged riot with helicopters and apparently all four members of Verona's SWAT team being called in. Lurman is clearly going for an over-the-top, highly stylized world with this one, but he doesn't really make the rules and constraints of this world clear to the audience. Also, for two people who just caused a riot, he's letting these guys go pretty easily. Oh hey, look, it's Brian Dennehy as Lord Montague. That guy was awesome in FX. We finally meet Romeo in a broken set of Moulin Rouge, and he's reciting poetry like he's sleep-deprived. Both Benvolio and Romeo have the right presence, but they don't know how to be vocally present for their speech. For Leo's Romeo, this will prove to be a big problem. At least in the scene with Lord Capulet in Paris, we get people who can speak the speech. But of course, Baz Luhrmann can't resist cutting to a sauna scene. It's decidedly less sexy than the one in the hologram. And now we're at the Capulet mansion, which is rather extravagant, going very well with the tone. I will grant that. At least by the time the nurse and Lady Capulet find Juliet, we will certainly have cut to every single possible framing of every inch of this goddamn Capulet house. So sure, I'll admit that. Rapid cuts along with saturation that's so cranked up you'd swear that the film had melted. At any rate, Lady Capulet is a screaming, pill-popping booze hound, and the nurse and Juliet are okay, I guess. We then get to the evening of the Capulet Ball. Where we meet someone who Baz Luhrmann has the decency to get right by accident. Harold Perrineau is a glorious Mercutio. He actually can speak the language, and he's intense and flamboyant in a role that calls for it. After a few more indications that Baz Luhrmann would really rather be making a music video, we finally get to the actual ball. Tybalt and Lady Capulet are making out because Baz Luhrmann read somewhere that someone once found that subtext and of course he latched onto it like a dog with a bone. Tybalt literally roars as we go into Romeo's mind and discover that he is definitely supposed to be high as a kite for this. Perrineau continues to be awesome as the center of attention in this scene. Romeo is high as balls and can't handle all the crazy, so he leaves to go get back with it, where he sees Sade in a white dress singing a sweet song. I posit that he's so high right now that this is what Mercutio looks like to him. But then he sees another pretty young blonde through a fish tank. Of course, with him being under the influence of various narcotics, it's quite possible that he's actually looking at his own reflection. Aw, timeless romance. I am more invested in the hilariously adorable Paris, who's dressed up as an astronaut and has a much more mentally sound meeting with Juliet. He's so cute! Hey, Pete Postlethwaite is the friar. Score number two for the blind squirrel that is Baz Luhrmann finding a nut in this mess. Friar Lawrence is awesome, and Leo is actually kinda good when he has to act opposite him. Yay! But he kicks off the scene shirtless in a room with young boys. That's... I don't even want to go there. Why is he shirtless? 
After a few quick references to other Shakespeare plays, a hypersaturated beach montage, and more quick cut editing later, we have another scene with Mercutio and Benvolio. Oh, Mercutio, don't descend to Benvolio's level of speech. Try to lift him up or not, whatever. This is bumming me out, since Benvolio is actually age-appropriate in this movie, but God, his speech, which seems to be infecting Perrineau's here, is terrible. At least the scene with the nurse and Juliet is fun. They both really know what they're doing. If this movie were a battle of the sexes, Team XX would be crushing right now. Girl power, Juliet, you can do it! I mean, it's not as if her stuff makes considerably more sense. Shut up, I'm off to celebrate women in Shakespeare. Girls one, boys zero. So now Romeo and Juliet can get married to the tune of the castrated choir performing Everybody's Free while led by a choir boy who seems to be either bored or sleep deprived. At least Leo just has to look pretty in this scene. That he can do. And now to the big fight scene. Tybalt and Mercutio taunt each other to insane close-ups and quick cuts as per usual. Tybalt kicks the crap out of Romeo, forcing Mercutio to step in, making this Mercutio's actions motivated by events that required more urgency than what the original text presents. And I know this isn't a Romeo and Juliet specific thing, but rather a Baz Luhrmann thing, but oh my god, we found a shot that lasts longer than five seconds. Oh my god, oh my god, look at how long this shot is. So there's a psychotic car chase where Romeo pulls some mean murder eyes before wrecking Tybalt's car and chasing him down to frantically repeat himself while Tybalt points a gun at his head. God, I just want him to go into exile, like, immediately. Well, first he has to consummate his marriage. In a room where figures that are meant to be worshipped religiously are looking right at them. You know, he has a broken rib. This is probably not the kind of activity that he wants to partake in right now. I mean, he's still going to be screaming, but not for the reasons that he was planning on. We move on to the post coitus scene, which is admittedly adorable, and kicks off with Romeo blasting awake with a terrified flashback to Dibble's death. Much like the director, DiCaprio seems to be a bit better at expressing emotions and concepts strictly visually than he is at using the dialogue. But eventually, Romeo leaves, ending the cuteness. And her parents come in, and Dad seemingly still drunk. And unlike most scenes with to play this to come, everyone starts screaming pretty much instantly before getting teed off that they should be that pissed off. It makes about as much sense as completely underdoing it. As the friar explains the false death potion, we get a montage behind him, which is super necessary. Juliet safely dead, we go to the conclusion. Of course, Romeo's buddy gets the wrong idea, but the friar can't clear up the confusion in front of everyone, so apparently Manch was out of cell phone range, it's the 90s, cell phones exist, whatever. Romeo freaks out a little after hearing about Juliet's death, and we see him heading back to Verona, while techno music plays, because when I think intense heartbreak, I think techno. Meanwhile, helicopters start flying around, the prince is freaking out, all the while nothing has happened yet. Shades of the Branna early fight scene, seriously, where we know that things are about to go bad, but the characters involved should not. <laughs> but they do, because bad storytelling. Romeo then goes to the apothecary, and with his stilted feel for the language, I just want the apothecary to respond to him with, what the f*** are you talking about, college boy? Because seriously, it just sounds wrong and doesn't go right here. And this apothecary just looks like he so doesn't give a Just saying, it's awesome. I'm still annoyed that the prince and his entire force are up in helicopters when there is no established need of it. But then Romeo suddenly has a hostage at the Capula tomb and is firing at them despite the fact that they're fairly out of range. Well, I'll say this for Leo. He might not know what to do with Shakespearean text, but he is sympathetic. I actually don't want to see him die. Also, those are a lot of candles. That's a bit of a fire hazard. One wrong move in this wake turns into a cremation. Juliet then ends it, which is a right bummer. Then we get a flashback of the relationship, even though both of the people who could be having such a flashback are dead. Continuity, thy name is Lerman. As bizarre as it is to say this, I really recommend this movie. Not because it's, well, good, but because it is very much worth seeing. If you already know your opinion of Baz Luhrmann, you probably have a sense of if you'll like this or not, but if you don't, Watch for the few things that do happen to be awesome, like Mercutio and the Friar or Juliet. Baz Luhrmann is a fantastic visual storyteller who can probably tell a two-hour story without any dialogue at all. 
Unfortunately, he didn't quite know what to do with the Shakespeare text that he was forced to present. The result is a two-hour music video with half-hearted presentations of dialogue. His treatment of the lines made it look like he felt like it was more of a forced nuisance than anything else. Amen to that, clunky but interesting. As adaptations into modern characterizations go, it outpaces the Almereda Hawk Hamlet by a mile, but it's exhausting to take in many ways. Alright guys, I got my protective goggles, I am, I am all set for the last codpiece laden monstrosity you have for us to review. So let's do this, let's do this right now, I'm ready, I'm ready, let's do it. Actually, this review did not include any prevalent cod pieces. And it's also over. The only movie without cod pieces and I missed it?! Next will be our wrap up with our favorite performances as well as our rankings of the top 7. Until next time, this has been Shargi. And this has been Cassius. Farewell. God knows when we shall meet again. Right, it feels like a parody. This is a weird movie. Weird movie. Guns and swords, not the same thing. The more you know.